Hello, everybody. So my talk today will be about uh, management and epidemiological considerations in regards to post-traumatic epilepsy. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, the only thing that I have to mention is that uh, I received funding through the OBI for this uh, uh, research project on post-traumatic epilepsy. The objectives will be to review the following topics in post-traumatic epilepsy, epidemiology, clinical presentation, treatment, and refractory epilepsy, and then I will talk about my project at the end. I would like to start with this quote from uh, Painfield. Um, who opened up a symposium on post-traumatic epilepsy in 1960 and was published in Epilepsy in 1961. Uh, he said the brain may be injured by contusion, laceration, compression, and it is well known that these insults may result in epilepsy after a silent period of strange ripening. That period lasts for months or years but these insults produce epilepsy in the case of one individual and not in the case of another. So we still share those uh, uh, feelings and those uh, concepts, uh, even though it's been more than uh, 50 years since uh, he mentioned those. These are some numbers in regard to traumatic brain injury. If you look at the uh, graph on the top left corner of the presentation, we have the estimated average annual rates of traumatic brain injury according or by sex in the U.S. The uh, red line represents females and the blue line represents males. As you can see, traumatic brain injury is has a high uh, uh, incidence uh, rate uh, uh, at the beginning of life and towards the end of life. And there is a peak uh, which occurs between the ages of 10 and 35, and is much more frequent in males. If you look at the pie chart on the top right-hand corner, we see that most of these, uh, and these are etiologies or causes of traumatic brain injury. As you can see, 35.2% of them are falls. And that probably is also the most uh, frequent cause of traumatic brain injury at the beginning of life and late in life. If you can see um, motor vehicle traffic or motor vehicle accidents, 17.3%, and that's probably the most common, um, one of the most common uh, causes of traumatic brain injury in, in young ages, and probably has to do a lot with the peak that we see in the 20s. As, uh, and if you put together uh, struck by or against 16.5%, assault 10%, and motor vehicle accident, 17.3%, um, that make also um, a, a big chunk. And in 21%, um, you know, it says unknown or others, and this unknown has to do with the fact that the uh, etiology of uh, traumatic brain or cause of traumatic brain injury is not well documented in uh, that population of databases. Now, this information and the pie chart comes from CDC, which obtained information from ER visits, hospitalizations, and deaths between 2002 and 2006 in the entire United States. The graph at the bottom of the slide is Canadian data, and it comes from CAIHI, a Canadian Institute for, uh, has to do with hospitalization data, meaning admissions to the emergency room as well as hospitalizations. And this is from 2007, and this is annual data from 2006, in which you can see that it's still um, there is a lot of uh, uh, traumatic brain injury later in life. And if you see the blue, blue is false, red is motor vehicle accident, and green is assault or intentional injury. As you can see, faults are very prominent early early life as well as late life, late in life. And motor vehicle accident is. Uh, the older you are, the lower the chances that the, the traumatic brain injury will be caused by a, a motor vehicle accident. Now, seizures may occur um, following TBI or traumatic brain injury. And in the past, we used to divide them into early and late uh, seizures. And now uh, there is a tendency to divide them into immediate, early, and late. 
Immediate are those seizures that occur within 24 hours following the traumatic brain injury. So it's quite common, for example, to see patients who sustain a severe injury and right after that, they will go into a, a seizure, usually a grand mal seizure. And those are what we would call immediate uh, uh, seizure or trauma, post-traumatic seizures. Early refer to all those seizures that occur between 24 hours and one week following the traumatic brain injury, and late refers to all those seizures that occur a week after the traumatic brain injury. The presence of early seizures as well as immediate seizures are risk factors for late seizures. And having late seizures in the context of an injury seen on the imaging make the diagnosis of post-traumatic epilepsy. Risk factors for early seizures as well, as well as for late seizures include depressed skull fracture and any kind of blood inside the brain, which could be intracranial hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, or subdural hemorrhage. Early seizures are particularly important risk factors for late seizures or for post-traumatic epilepsy, as the risks go from 2 to 14 to 30%, depending on what study you read. This information is obtained from four studies that were published between 2009 and 2011. There is nothing new other than one Danish study that I will mention later um, that is much more recent. In regards to the traumatic or the head injury, there is no uniform agreement on how to classify the severity of the head injury. I mean, one simple way to do it is just to describe this. There was um, structural damage with the brain injury or not. But if anything, the American Academy of Neurology and most epidemiological studies use the definition as coined by Hess Dorfer, a neuroepidemiologist in, the, in New York who, published, who has published a lot on this. And she um, divided the head injuries into mild, moderate, and severe. Mild head injury refers to the trauma to the head without any evidence of an intracranial structural pathology. And if there was loss of consciousness, it lasted less than 30 minutes. Moderate head trauma refers to loss of episode of loss of consciousness that lasted between 30 minutes and 24 hours with or without skull fracture. And severe refers to a significant structural damage, brain, brain damage. Um, patients may go into coma, encephalopathy, amnesia, and a loss of consciousness usually was seen uh, lasting longer than 24 hours. In regards to epilepsy uh, after traumatic brain injury, as I mentioned when I was uh, um, given the definitions of immediate seizures, uh, early seizures, and late seizures. When you have a, a late seizure in the context of an structural damage caused by TBI, that's what we call post-traumatic epilepsy. And we know that the, low, the higher the severity, the higher the risk of subsequent epilepsy. But in a study published in 2010 in the journal Neurology, uh, a group of Danish investigators uh, assess what happened to the entire population of Denmark that was included in a populational database, which include 1.6 million uh, children and young adults that were followed up to 30 years after uh, the trauma. And they found that there is a relative risk for epilepsy in, in any kind of traumatic brain injury or any kind of head trauma. For mild traumatic brain injury, the relative risk was 2.2 while for severe traumatic brain injury, the relative risk was 7.4. And if there was a skull fracture, just a skull fracture, it would increase your relative risk to 2.17. This study found that there was higher risk if the patients were older than 15, at the, sorry, the higher risk if they were 15 or older than 15 at the time of the traumatic brain injury, higher risk in women, and higher risk in those who had a family history of epilepsy. This is the graph taken by that, by that, by, uh, from that article, in which you can see that, you know, in the, in the long axis and the uh, horizontal axis, you have years after injury, and the vertical axis, you have relative risk of epilepsy. And following a brain injury, there is a higher risk of uh, developed epilepsy in the initial years following the injury. 
but the risk continues to be high in regards to the uh, reference years after the injury. And if you can see the extreme of the graph on the right side, uh, even more than 10 years after injury, the risk remains high. And it's higher when there is a severe brain injury, and we already defined what severe is. But it was also high for mild brain injury, and a bit higher if there was a skull fracture. So this is probably one of the latest uh, populational studies in regards to uh, uh, post uh, or yeah post traumatic epilepsy. Now, Anegers um, in 1998 uh, published uh, data from uh, the U.S. using also populational databases and found if you pay attention to the graph on the left hand side, on the uh, uh, horizontal axis we have years after brain injury and the probability of developing seizures is in the vertical axis. And as you can see, the more severe the injury, the higher the probability that seizures will happen at some point in your life. And that's what it means with cumulative probability. And if you look at the graph on the right side, it's quite similar to the previous graph in the way that in the initial years following traumatic brain injury, there is a higher chance for seizures to occur, and this decreases over time, but the risk to develop seizures is still higher compared to the population that hasn't had any uh, brain injury. So in regards to the natural history of post-traumatic seizures or post-traumatic epilepsy, we know that most patients, in most patients, sorry, the seizures happen within the first uh, years, but really, Within the first and, and within the first two years, more than 80% of patients will have seizures. But there have been cases in which there has been long latency period. The interesting thing in regards to the type of seizures is that if the seizure happening early, meaning in the, in the initial years following or initial months to years following traumatic injury, the seizures are usually generalized from clonic. And if the seizures occur later, let's say many years after the traumatic injury, the seizures are usually focal. But the interesting thing is that two-thirds of these focal seizures will go into secondary generalization. And it is more frequent if the injury occur in the temporal lobe followed by the frontal lobe and less frequency if the injury occur in the occipital or parietal lobes. The diagnosis is usually based on history and examination. Imaging is always needed in order to uh, identify if there was any kind of structural damage to the brain. EEG is also important. And EMU, admission to an epilepsy monitoring unit, neuropsychological testing and psychological assessment, are usually needed in those patients who had um, intractable epilepsy or those who had psychiatric sequela from the uh, uh, traumatic brain injury. Another important topic is the fact that patients following traumatic injury can have seizures that we call subclinical, meaning seizures in which even though the patient is seizing, um, there are no clinical manifestations of these seizures. And they are quite relatively common, including what we call non-convulsive status epilepticus, meaning somebody who is seizing but is actually not convulsing. And how do we know that? Well, there was a study in 2013 published in Epilepsy in which they included 87 pediatric patients. And in all these patients who had traumatic brain injury and were admitted to the hospital, continuous EEG recordings were performed. And in 42.5% of these patients, they found uh, clinical seizures, but in more than a third of them, they found subclinical seizures and because they saw a seizure pattern in the EEG recordings, and most of them were non-convulsive status epilepticus, meaning that these changes in the EEG recordings lasted longer than 30 minutes. What we don't know exactly is what happened when you, what are the sequela or the consequences of having these episodes of non-convulsive status epilepticus? There has been some anecdotal um, evidence from case reports and editorials and reviews that perhaps the presence of non-convulsive status epilepticus will lead into what we call hippocampal atrophy, meaning shrinking of your hippocampi. 
and these may put you at risk of higher seizure or higher risk of seizures. Hence, um, there is this uh, thinking that one has to be aggressive when treating these non-convulsive status epilepticus, but there is a lot of debate about that. For that reason, when you have trauma or the, when, there is a, when you encounter a patient with trauma that requires admission to the hospital or goes into an ICU, it would be important to do continuous EEG or continuous EEG with video. In regard to the medicals management, <clears throat> it's similar to what we do in anybody with epilepsy. Medical treatment has to be uh, uh, has to be the first line or the first um, action that you have to uh, take. Uh, but you always have to uh, think that unnecessary treatment with anti-epileptic medications may impair neurorehabilitation. Now, we in the initial slides we spoke about immediate seizures, early seizures, and late seizures. Is there any evidence that we have to use anti-epileptic medications in those who had severe, let's say, severe brain trauma to prevent seizures? Well, there is no evidence for that. But there is some evidence that if we give anti-epileptic medications in the acute phase of moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, we might be able to decrease the incidence of that, those early post-traumatic seizures. But unfortunately, the, there is no evidence that would indicate that if you continue that treatment beyond the seven days, you will change the prognosis for developing epilepsy in, some, in, in, in patients with brain trauma. There was one study, it's a relatively old study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, in which Temkin, a neuroepidemiologist uh, uh, in Seattle at that time, used phenytoin and found the phenytoin decreased the incidence of early post-traumatic seizures from 14.2 to 3.6%. Because of that, the Brain Trauma Foundation and the American Academy of Neurology recommend the use of anti-epileptic medications, particularly phenytoin, because that was the only study available, for the first seven days following severe traumatic brain injury. But they do not recommend continuing the phenytoin uh, past the seven days following the traumatic brain injury. The neurosurgeons and the neurocritical care physicians have a tendency to put patients on medications uh, for these seven days based on those guidelines. But in the United States and in Europe, levetiracetam is a medication that has gained popularity. And that probably has to do with the fact that levetiracetam do not cause uh, the same side effects as dilantin, and actually appear to have fewer side effects. And even though there has not been any randomized controlled trials, comparative studies have shown that the efficacy appeared to be similar between levetiracetam and phenytoin, and the side effects are fewer when we use levetiracetam. Levetiracetam in um, observational studies has not been found to be effective uh, at reducing the risk of post-traumatic epilepsy. That is why levetiracetam is not Ad, uh, advice to be used seven days after the traumatic, uh, traumatic brain injury either, the same situation as with phenytoin. When a patient has late seizures, or what we would call uh, post-traumatic epilepsy, we don't, we don't have to wait for a second seizure, as the definition, the former definition of epilepsy would say. We follow the newer definition of epilepsy, which is one seizure in, the, in uh, the context of somebody who has a higher chance to develop seizure because of a structural brain abnormality. And the principles of uh, treatment uh, for post-traumatic epilepsy are similar to other focal epilepsies. There is no doctrine on the duration of anti-epileptic treatment because there is nothing in the medical literature to guide you on how, how to do that. Some patients with post-traumatic epilepsy do not respond to two or more anti-epileptic medications, something that we call intractable post-traumatic epilepsy. An epilepsy surgery should be considered in all these patients. The outcome following a surgical intervention depends on the inadequate seizure onset localization, which is similar to any other type of epilepsy. 
and an adequate seizure onset localization may be, may be uh, identified using the standard admission to the epilepsy unit, uh, MRI, neuropsychological testing, and other tests like PET or SPET. The interesting thing is that in some patients with post-traumatic epilepsy, we found that the mesial temporal lobe is the one affected. And when that is the case, the outcomes are comparable between post-traumatic epilepsy and non-post-traumatic epilepsy. The situation is different when, ne when seizures of neocortical origin or extratemporal lobe origin occurs. Apparently, one may think that those are less ideal surgical candidates, but it all depends on how good we are able to localize the seizure onset. When somebody has a patient with um, medical intractable epilepsy and surgery needs to be considered, during the assessment of these patients, one has to consider that seizure foci may be difficult to localize, usually because of technical issues. You know, usually patients with traumatic, severe traumatic brain injury have undergone, have undergone uh, surgical treatment, so they may have craniotomies, which may cause bridge rhythms, which are these special rhythms in the EG that are seen when there is a skull defect, and that may misguide you um, or give you a false uh, localization, or, or, or you have to be careful with the interpretation of the EEG. Also, most patients with severe traumatic injury with focal lesions that you can identify in the MRI most likely had diffuse axonal injury or diffuse cerebral injury at the time of the injury. So, E, you may see uh, uh, during your EEG recordings that there are multiple epileptic foci that even they may overlap with eloquent brain regions. Despite this empirical information, you should record seizures because the seizures may come from only one spot in the brain. And finally, the other consideration is that all patients with severe traumatic injury because of the structural damage, may develop scar tissue and adhesions that can make things much more technically difficult for the surgeon and may increase the risk of surgical complications. Well, if, um, if the patient with uh, post-traumatic medically refractory epilepsy is not a candidate for epilepsy surgery, then there are other options that we can consider. One of them, uh, the main one is neurostimulation. And the use of the vagus, vagus nerve stimulation is something that we consider when the patient is not a candidate for surgery because it's multifocal, because it's a regional epilepsy, or because the seizures are coming from eloquent areas. We use the stimulation of the vagus nerve. And this is usually an adjunctive treatment to medical therapy. And even though there has been no randomized controlled trials, there was an observational study published in 2012 in which uh, the authors found that there was a higher uh, percentage of, rate of uh, seizure improve improvement in patients with post-traumatic epilepsy as compared to those who did not have traumatic epilepsy. The numbers were uh, seen uh, after two years of follow-up, and 78% um, of cases noticed a more than 50% seizure reduction in those with post-traumatic epilepsy, while only 61% in those without post-traumatic epilepsy. Other uh, types of neurostimulation include the responsive neural stimulation, which is something that is not available in Canada, but available in the US, uh, in which you identify the area of epileptogenic, uh, the epileptic onset, and if this is located in an eloquent area, then let's say speech, motor, uh, or vision, you can use a device that is essentially a small EEG that identifies the seizure and release an electrical current to stop the seizure. And of course, the anterior, the stimulation of the anterior nucleus of the thalami, which is available in Canada, and we usually uh, uh, recommend it when the vagus nerve stimulator doesn't uh, work. I would like to present you an illustrat illustrative case of somebody who had intractable epilepsy due to trauma. This is a 34-year-old right-handed female who, in 1996, uh, while crossing the street, was hit by a truck. It was a severe traumatic brain injury, and there was a skull fracture bilaterally. She was in coma for two weeks, and there was a need for an inter a neuros neurosurgical intervention to save her life. So basically, an evacuation of intracranial hemorrhage. 
She was in hospital for a total of six months, including rehabilitation, and this was in Vancouver. Then later on, she moved to Ontario. And even though she had immediate post-traumatic seizures in the form of generalized tonic-clonic seizures and received treatment for that, she was seizure-free until 2001, when she began having a different type of seizures, uh, of focal seizures of this cognitive type with limbic semiology, uh, occurring three, approximately three every two weeks, and these seizures would occasionally secondary generalize. These are uh, samples of her uh, scan. As you can see in the top uh, uh, picture, there is a large uh, area of encephalomalacia with a cavity in the uh, right frontal region. The one in the middle shows some changes in the uh, uh, right temporal region as well, particularly in the neocortex. And in the bottom picture, you see some changes in the uh, left temporal region neocortically. She was assessed initially with uh, uh, EEG and was found to have independent bitemporal spikes, meaning that the activity appears to be much more uh, frequent in the temporal lobes, not much was seen in the frontal regions. She was admitted to the epilepsy unit for, uh, in order to capture seizures and to see if she was a surgical candidate, given that she tried multiple anti-epileptic medications and was still having frequent seizures. The uh, presence of the bitemporal spikes independently maximum on the left were confirmed, but unfortunately, she had bitemporal lobe seizures. Three seizures were captured from the right temporal lobe, and one seizure was captured from the left temporal lobe. Neuropsychological testing could not be completed due to language barrier. The English was her second language, and she was her English was not uh, as good to uh, undergo a, a neuropsychological assessment at that point. Given that there were spikes in both temporal lobes and the seizures were coming from both temporal lobes, but the semiology of the seizures were ex exactly the same when the seizures came from the right as well as from the left, we decided to undergo placement of intracranial electrodes. These are uh, MRI pictures showing you that uh, the placement of some of the electrodes, um, as you can see at uh, the bottom left, uh, sorry, the top left, uh, the uh, uh, depth electrodes were in the left hippocampus, uh, the top right, uh, the electrodes were in the right amygdala, the bottom right uh, electrodes in the right hippocampus, and the bottom left electrodes in the uh, um, amygdala, hippocampus, and as you can see, some of the electrodes were also touching the neocortical cortex. Unfortunately, the stereo, EG, the stereo EG show independent bitemporal spikes, and again, seven seizures were captured from the right temporal lobe, and three seizures were captured from the left temporal lobe. So the patient was found not to be a surgical candidate, given that the seizures were, the seizures were starting from both uh, temporal lobes. So she underwent placement of the vagus nerve stimulator, and the output current, which is the first parameter mentioned, then, mentioned there, was increased. She's been on all anti-epileptic medications, different combinations, and she's still having this, the same discognitive seizures, a bit less frequent once a month, and generalized tonic-clonic seizures every three to six months. She's been readmitted to the epilepsy unit uh, one year ago, and we did not see any changes to her uh, epilepsy as, as still continues to, uh, the seizures continue to emanate from both uh, temporal lobes. So this is just to give you an example how complicated the, the clinical picture can be in somebody with post-traumatic epilepsy. I don't think that we, um, on my review for this talk, I couldn't uh, come across any paper um, giving me a number of how many patients with post-traumatic epilepsy go into uh, being intractable. But one has to assume that perhaps it's similar to what has been published in the literature for all focal epilepsy, which is 70% respond well to the medication and 30% do not. My final comments have to do with the study that I'm um, doing, uh, thanks to the OVI and EPLINK. We are, uh, in a prospective manner, collecting patients who have uh, 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 had uh, any type of traumatic brain injury and follow them over time to see uh, who developed epilepsy 
and to see if we are able to identify common demographic and clinical characteristics of those who develop epilepsy, to see if we can predict who will develop epilepsy. The study um, has ended up being much more complicated than what it was uh, thought at the beginning. And the main issue has to do with recruitment. Um, as many patients do not want to be enrolled in the study because they don't want to be seen many times for the following years. So most of the patients that we have admitted or we have recruited in the study are patients older than 50 and actually more of, most of them older than 60. And that has to do with the fact that they are now retired and I guess they have time to participate in the study. The other part of the study that we're trying to do is a subset of patients and this is a random selection. It's not uh, need, uh, they don't have to have any particular uh, type of head trauma or type of, uh, of uh, clinical picture. They are enrolled for a series of scans um, that are performed at the onset, and then uh, six months, and then one year, and then one, and then two years, to see if there are any changes um, that in imaging that can be identified and can be uh, can serve as pro uh, prognostic indicators for the development of epilepsy. Uh, recently, I, uh, my study has received funding from Epilepsy Ontario, and this funding will not only help with the prospective uh, recruitment of patients with traumatic brain injury, but this will allow me to pro retrospectively, retrospectively review the uh, data from our epilepsy center to see how many patients with post-traumatic epilepsy has been, have been seen in our center and how many of those develop intractable epilepsy and see what kind of treatment those with intractable epilepsy have received, how many actually underwent surgery, and how many became seizure-free following the surgical procedure. We hope to complete that retrospective part of the study in the next few months, but for the prospective study, we hope to co continue collecting data in order to have a larger uh, sample. So that's the end of my presentation. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Okay, uh, first question would really be about sports. You, you've indicated that even fairly mild traumatic brain injury can cause later epilepsy. And we have all sorts of sports figures who have repeated concussions. Uh, are we looking at, at uh, probable development of, of uh, epilepsy in these, these young people? Yes, according to the Danish study, um, concussions, which uh, uh, really fall into the category of mild uh, brain injury, increase your chances to develop epilepsy later in life. And the relative risk is only 2.1 as compared to 4 or 5.0 uh, uh, in, in those who had moderate to severe epilepsy. Yes, those with concussion have higher chances to develop epilepsy compared to the general population. This is a, a question related to soccer football. Um, part of the part of the uh, way you approach soccer is you head the ball. Is that a good idea? Or is that going to be a bad idea in terms of, of brain damage and epilepsy? <laughs> so, um, with with soccer, the, the the chances for traumatic brain injury, believe it or not, are higher in uh, female soccer than male soccer. Uh, the um, heading the ball has not been shown to cause concussions or any, any kind of traumatic uh, or any kind of damage to the brain. But unfortunately, this information that I'm giving you comes from retrospective studies, small series uh, from one team or two teams. But, uh, you know, I don't know if you have to look at to watch the games from the last uh, World Cup. There were some serious traumatic brain injuries or serious uh, heading, not really heading to the ball, but serious head, head collision or foot to head collision uh, that knock some of the, the players out. I'm pretty sure in those situations, uh, the risk is higher, but again, we don't have any data in the medical literature in regards to soccer. Dr. Zhang has a question. is, what's the role of hemorrhage in severe TBI and probably re relationship to epilepsy? I think uh, even though the, the, the literature is not clear about that, um, I'm pretty sure that 
hemorrhage is one of the main reasons why patients may develop uh, seizures and epilepsy. You know, I mentioned that 80, more than 80% of patients will develop epilepsy in the early years following, or in the early months to years following traumatic brain injury. The cases that we see later on are usually associated with the presence of blood products, particularly hemocytic in the brain, which we know is highly irritative and highly epileptogenic. So I personally think that the hemorrhage plays a very important role in the development of seizures, and most likely hemorrhage is the reason why patients develop epilepsy at a higher rate than those without uh, bleed. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question from Dr. Cortez. The, the question from Dr. Cortez, is there any role for anti-inflammatories in, in preventing the development of post-traumatic epilepsy? No. Um, at the, uh, during the CLA, there was a session on post-traumatic epilepsy, and uh, I think it was Dr. Eileen Reed who presented uh, some data on the different compounds and uh, uh, that have been used in uh, animal models of post-traumatic epilepsy. And there was, uh, at some point, one study using uh, prednisone uh, and, and, and another, another anti-inflammatory agent and found not to have any effect in, post in models of post-traumatic epilepsy. Thank you. I think Dr. Zhang has another question. Okay, I think that if I got the question straight, it's when you have um, traumatic brain injury, uh, imaging is an important predictor of, of post-traumatic epilepsy, but how about cognitive testing, for instance, related to the temporal lobe? That's a good question. I mean, imaging, we know for sure. Uh, cognitive testing has not been used as far as... I, ne I haven't come across with any article showing that cognitive testing to be predictor of uh, seizure development or seizure occurrence. So, uh, I, I cannot comment further than that, but, but that's a good question. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe it plays a role. I, I have a question, really. Uh, when you have, if, uh, when you have tra traumatic brain injury, some patients go on to develop post-traumatic epilepsy, some don't. Do you think that relates to severity of the injury, or is it possible contribution of genetic factors? Well, the genetic factors is something that I always think plays a role in everything. How come I can put in a room many patients with the same type of trauma, and there will be some that will not develop epilepsy? So I think genetic factors plays a role. And if you look at um, one of the studies that I presented, show that if there was uh, the chances to develop post-traumatic epilepsy are higher in those who have a family history of epilepsy. So. That tells you that genetics play a role, most likely. And it's probably as, as important as the, well, not as important as the severity, but also plays an important role. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any last questions? Going once? Okay, Dr. Berneo, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Thanks very okay. much. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you.